So before we get started, just to say that this session is being translated into French and Spanish. So we have uh, three languages available for you. Um, thank you very much, um, all of you, for joining us here today. My name is Tanya Beckett. Um, I'm a BBC broadcaster. I am extremely honoured to be here today amongst uh, such a high-profile um, panel. Um, of people. As you know, we have two panels, two speakers, and then two panels. What we are about to discuss is arguably, I think, going to be one of the, not, if not the major uh, conundrum of this century, and that is social inequality. You don't know, need me to tell you that if you don't tackle it, um, then you have um, uh, all sorts of problems that exhibit themselves in uh, voter populations. You have the potential for democracy being undermined and also social unrest. We also have, of course, some very uh, pressing problems. Over 600 million new jobs need to be created by 2030. We also have 780 million women and men uh, working but not earning enough to lift themselves out of poverty. So how do we achieve a uh, solution to this? Well, Global Deal uh, was set up just about a year ago by the Swedish uh, PM who sits here on my right. And um, during that time, an extraordinary num uh, number of partners have come together to try to help solve um, this problem. As you can see, an impressive list of nearly 60 names have uh, put their uh, weight behind this initiative to try to come up with some solutions as to how we deal with this problem. As I've uh, mentioned, we are going to hear from two speakers, first of all, both on my right and my left, and then we're going to go on to two discussion panels, one of which is going to talk about the environment in which we're operating, and the next one is hopefully going to provide um, some solutions, offer some solutions going forward to this very pressing and difficult problem. So allow me first, and I'm very honoured to introduce to you the Swedish PM, Stefan Löfven, who initiated the Global Deal. And allow me please to welcome him to make some introductory remarks. Thank you so much, um, Director General. Uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is for me a great, great honor to have been invited to, to speak uh, in front of you here today and, of course, to listen to all the, the, the contributions. Now, uh, trade is, is uh, the engine for, uh, in the global economy. It benefits individuals, communities, uh, businesses, uh, the whole societies and countries. And I sometimes boast uh, about representing the most trade-friendly country in the world because openness to the world and, and free and fair trade is a key future of, or feature sorry, of, of the Swedish model. Uh, over the years, Sweden has produced so much iron ore and uh, forestry products uh, that we have been able to, to use, much more than we uh, are able to use. We have produced uh, uh, more Volvos and Saabs than Swedes uh, could drive on, on, our, on our roads. We have sold uh, Nordic design and also unique IT solutions, and therefore we have been able to buy things also that we do not produce ourselves. Uh, we have been inspired by and learned also from uh, the ideas and, and innovation of others. Simply put, trade has made our country grow. Trade is one important factor that has successfully taken Sweden from being one of the poorest countries in the, the outskirts of Europe to being one of the world's richest and also placed at, uh, at the very forefront of the global economy. It took us about 100 years. And uh, the foundation was and remains, of course, domestically smart production, innovation, social security, but also a global market economy, free trade, openness and competition. So as a small export-based uh, economy, Sweden will never hesitate in striving for a world that tirelessly seeks new ways of ensuring free and fair trade. Now, that is why I'm so pleased to be here today at the WTO, the heart of the multilateral trade system, to discuss how the global deal for decent work and, and inclusive growth can play a role 
also in trade discussions so that the benefits of trade can be better and more widely uh, shared. Because let's be frank, trade is a great generator of, of wealth in history. It has raised standards of living uh, worldwide. Millions and millions of people have been lifted out of poverty and so many have benefited from, from trade. No question. But, and there is a but, when inequalities increase, as we have seen over the last uh, few decades, and the few amass wealth at the expense of the many, the economy in the long run is destabilized. There is a growing international consensus now that reducing inequalities is one of the great challenges of our time. It is also one of the great opportunities of our time. We must address growing public skepticism over the benefits of free trade and globalization. We must address rising distrust in political solution. Now, there is a growing belief that politicians serve the few and not the many, and that paves the way for extreme and populist alternatives. It is time to put people first. It is time to ensure that globalization oppresses no one but benefits everyone. So addressing issues such as inequality, unemployment and unfair practices is our moral duty, but it is much more than that. It's also the smart thing to do because it will boost productivity and strengthen our economies. It's also the most effective means of eradicating poverty. So let's improve access to the labor market, get more people into work. Let's ensure decent working conditions and put an end to unfair practices. Let's better manage the forces of globalization so that change can be and will be an opportunity and not a threat. And that is what the Global Deal is all about. That is, was also the conclusions from the summit on um, uh, fair jobs and growth, uh, the European Union summit that we held in Gothenburg in Sweden last Friday. These are the conclusions. And in that perspective, social dialogue is an important tool for managing people's fears and, and sense of unfairness, and also for channeling, channeling their innovativeness, their dedication, their pride in their work. And for this reason, we can also say, if you want to improve a society, if you want to create inclusive growth, make sure you improve people's working conditions. Now, the aim of the Global Deal is not to promote a, a specific model, but rather to create a political impetus and cooperation platforms to promote social dialogue. The Global Deal Initiative encourages labor market cooperation and collaboration, and by that also enhancing economic stability and shared prosperity. I'm convinced that social dialogue is the best way for workers and employers to improve both working conditions as well as the business climate, based on local and national circumstances. And of course, governments must be a partner in this dialogue. And the, this win-win-win situation is a driving force behind our uh, initiative, uh, the Global Deal. And at the same time, countries must actively contribute to, to promoting uh, democratic uh, development, uh, basic un trade union rights, basic human rights in the labor market, but also good conditions for the enterprises, meaning basic education, retraining, infrastructure, energy, access to capital, and so on. And this is the very foundation of, of social dialogue. So our objective is for the Global Deal to strengthen workers, businesses, and societies alike, and to become a concrete tool to help to achieve UN Global Goal number eight, to promote decent work and uh, economic growth, but also goal number 10, uh, to reduce inequalities. There are already a number of governments, businesses, trade unions and other organizations pursuing this initiative together now with the ILO and OECD. 
The Global Deal builds on voluntary commitments from its partners. So far, 58 partners and, uh, are there, and I do hope that also your organizations, companies, and countries will join the Global Deal. Lastly, thank you for hosting us, Director General. Uh, I greatly value this cooperation. It is important. I very much look forward now to listen to the experts here today and to the advice of our eminent panelists. Thank you so much. Prime Minister, thank you. Well, uh, you uh, got there ahead of me and pointed out, of course, the significance of uh, meeting here uh, at the WTO. This is, uh, I think, uh, significant because it recognizes that even here at the heart of, uh, as you put it, the global trade system, there is a recognition uh, that a lot needs to be done in this area. So um, allow me then uh, to introduce our next speaker, who, of course, is the Director General, Roberto Azevedo of the WTO. Please welcome him. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tanya, Prime Minister Lovin, um, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, uh, good morning uh, to everyone. Welcome uh, to the WTO. And I'd like uh, to say a particular or to extend a particular uh, warm welcome uh, to ILO Director General Guy Ryder, uh, who is here with us today, Minister uh, Abdullahi of uh, Ethiopia, uh, Borger Brende, President of the uh, uh, World Economic Forum, uh, who is an old friend of the WTO, um, uh, the fellow panelists who are here uh, today. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we're very pleased, uh, actually, to host uh, this high-level seminar uh, on the global deal and trade today. Um, it is a real honor uh, to have Prime Minister uh, Lovin uh, with us uh, on this occasion. Uh, Sweden uh, is a champion of multilateralism. Um, it was a founding member of the WTO uh, and is very active uh, in our work uh, here in Geneva across a number of areas. Um, and indeed, uh, uh, Sweden uh, is one of the main donors uh, of WTO programs uh, which aim to help uh, uh, the poorest uh, members uh, to build uh, their trading capacity. And I think that this shows uh, our shared belief that trade is one of the best uh, anti-poverty uh, and pro-development tools that we have. So I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to thank again uh, Sweden and Prime Minister Lovin uh, for your engagement and your uh, generosity. Um, and Sweden's leadership uh, does not stop there. Uh, you're helping to set the agenda uh, on many uh, international issues uh, and the global deal is just a very uh, important example of that. Um, the global deal has uh, social dialogue and collaboration at its core. Mm. Uh, and it draws attention to issues that are close to our heart here at the WTO, uh, such as uh, making uh, the global economy more inclusive, uh, such as uh, spreading the benefits of trade uh, to everyone. And I want to commend uh, Prime Minister Lovin again uh, for his leadership here. Um, when we met uh, earlier this year, uh, the Prime Minister was very keen uh, to work with uh, international institutions uh, to support this initiative, so I'm glad to continue that conversation today. Uh, in fact, uh, today's event uh, builds on our ongoing WTO uh, trade dialogues uh, initiative. And this is, this is an initiative of the WTO that is also uh, broadening the conversation uh, and hearing from new voices. Uh, it's about ensuring that stakeholders uh, can highlight issues that are important to them. And in this way, uh, broadening uh, and enriching uh, our debates at the WTO. Uh, since uh, the Trade Dialogues uh, Initiative was created, we've had a, a, a number of important and insightful conversations, uh, reaching out to business, uh, to labor, uh, to think tanks, academia, um, and others. Um, so now I'm pleased to see how these complementary efforts, like the trade dialogues of the WTO, the global deal, how they can be an engine uh, to help drive inclusive growth uh, everywhere. So clearly this is an important conversation um, because while uh, globalization uh, has brought progress 
overall, uh, we need uh, to recognize that not all uh, have been able to participate and to benefit uh, from this growth. So many people feel disconnected uh, from economic progress, and we need uh, to respond to this situation. And this means using all tools available to promote growth, uh, development, job creation, and inclusivity. Now, to help inform uh, the conversation today, I'd like to build uh, on the work that the WTO has been doing on this front. Um, for example, uh, inclusivity uh, was at the forefront of our conversation at this year's public forum, uh, where we looked at the big issues uh, at the heart of the current uh, public debate on trade. Um, and to support this, uh, we launched uh, the 2017 World Trade Report, um, which looked precisely at the interplay between technology, uh, trade, and jobs. Um, and, and earlier this year, uh, we, because this was in September at the public forum here in the WTO, uh, earlier the, in the year, we launched two other uh, publications uh, focused on, uh, uh, on these topics. Uh, the first one was a joint report with the IMF and the World Bank um, aimed at making trade uh, an engine of growth for all. Uh, and the second paper was a joint report with the ILO uh, that looks precisely at the relationship between trade, skills, and jobs in today's economy. And this activity has generated a wealth of data uh, and many interesting uh, insights. And I would like to share with you uh, a few points, three, no more than three, um, with you today. The first one uh, is the unprecedented speed and pace of changes in today's economy. Um, of course, uh, the story uh, of economic progress is also a story of economic change and adaptation. Now, as before, uh, individuals, firms, societies are looking to adapt uh, and they are looking to respond uh, to evolving economic technological conditions and to share in their benefits. Um, however, uh, what is different from the past now is the, the pace and the scale of these changes. Now, just to, have, uh, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, uh, with $1 uh, in 1990, uh, you could transmit one bit per second. $1 in 1990, one bit per second. In 2002, $1 allowed you to transmit 10,000 bits per second. In 2005, just three years later, the same dollar could transmit 100,000 bits per second. And we looked at that over time, and that is exponential growth, and it doesn't look like it's slowing down. So that is the reality of today. Uh, automation, digitization, and new business models are revolutionizing the global economy in a way that is structural. Uh, and of course, this has an impact in the way that we trade and that we do business. Uh, trading services, data, uh, and information is surging across digital platforms. Um, and we know that uh, traditional trade in manufactured goods, uh, agricultural products, or natural resources is also increasingly enabled uh, by digital technologies. And all this, of course, presents many opportunities um, to leverage these forces for growth and development. Um, and I think that this will be potentially the defining uh, challenge of our age. But understanding and seizing opportunities is just part of the story. This is not the whole story. Um, and this brings me to my second point, uh, which is that while uh, these technological advances uh, have generated uh, important uh, benefits for economies overall, uh, they can, in fact, have uh, adverse uh, impact on specific groups or regions. So this is also part of the story. Uh, technological progress, for example, uh, is an important source of changes in the labor market changes. So higher productivity uh, is responsible for eight out of 10 job losses uh, in some economies. So it's not cheaper imports, it's just new technologies, innovation. Uh, and these forces, uh, they also have an impact on the overall structure of the employment. So productivity gains uh, from new technologies are driving uh, shifts uh, in employment patterns. 
uh, and they are uh, dramatically reducing the demand uh, for labor in sectors such as agriculture uh, or manufacturing. Um, and at the same time, of course, uh, the proportion of jobs in services keeps on increasing. Um, and all over the world, the demand for skilled uh, workers increases, while the number of low uh, or middle skill uh, jobs is declining. Now, these changes, um, they raise important uh, adjustment challenges as workers uh, who lose their jobs uh, in declining sectors uh, or in those uh, exposed regions, um, they may not always be well equipped um, to adapt to these changes and to fill the jobs that are opening up somewhere else. So the benefits that clearly exist uh, across the economy um, is of little comfort uh, for someone who lost his job. Now, developing so uh, effective policies uh, to support people uh, and to adjust uh, to this new reality is fundamental. Uh, we need to ensure that the benefits of economic progress reaches, if not everybody, as many people as possible. Um, and that leads me to the third and final point. Um, we need to find uh, more creative uh, and effective ways to adjust uh, to economic change. And an important element here is domestic policy. Uh, sustainable uh, and balanced economic progress uh, will hinge on the ability of economies to adjust to changes and promote greater inclusiveness. Uh, and this includes, for example, more active labor market policies, uh, education policies, and the provision of support for workers. Um, active labor market policies can help uh, workers uh, retrain and find new job openings, assist them with relocation, encouraging their transition and, new, and, and offering new opportunities. Um, more comprehensive, uh, flexible and forward-looking policies in investments uh, and investments in education um, from the primary all the way to post-secondary levels, they're also critical. Uh, to equip uh, individuals to take advantage of the opportunities of this new uh, age of technology. Um, in addition to that, uh, experience uh, suggests that success uh, in facilitating uh, these adjustments uh, involves finding an appropriate balance uh, between the labor market flexibility uh, on the one hand and the proper employment standards on the other. So there is a balance uh, to be found here, and it's not an easy one, I have to tell you. Um, and other policies also that increase competitiveness, uh, efficient and reliable infrastructure, for example, or well-functioning financial markets, um, measures that improve the predictability of trade uh, and that help to level uh, the playing field, all those uh, can also make uh, the economy more responsive uh, to the challenges and facilitate adjustment. What is the big problem that we have here uh, is that there is no one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, each country will have to figure out its own recipe, its own policies, and the appropriate mix of policies that will work for them, for their particular needs. Um, and what we also see is that some countries, some economies, seem to be adjusting better than others uh, to the challenges and opportunities offered by trade and technology. Uh, and looking at these experiences, particularly of those that are adjusting better, uh, can help to shed light uh, to possible ways to approach uh, these challenges. So I'm very pleased to say uh, that with the support of the Swedish government, um, we will be working uh, to deepen the work in this area. Uh, we will be compiling a dossier of adjustment policies in selected countries. Uh, and this will build precisely on the 2017 World Trade Report that I mentioned um, and draw uh, further lessons uh, from different experiences that countries have had. Um, it will aim to identify uh, success stories uh, which can further inform uh, the conversation on these issues. Now, expanding this research uh, will be very valuable, uh, but this isn't the limit of the WTO's contribution on these issues, uh, quite far from it. Um, I think we provide a forum for governments to meet, to talk, negotiate, 
We offer a platform uh, to discuss how to maximize the benefits of economic changes, uh, minimize the adverse consequences. Uh, this will be uh, brought to focus at the Ministerial Conference in Buenos Aires uh, next month, in a, in a couple of weeks, actually. Um, a range of issues are being discussed by members, and inclusivity is a common thread up to all those discussions. Uh, many members are talking about how to help small and medium enterprises, uh, how to leverage the potential of e-commerce uh, to ensure that more people can join the global trade flows. And those conversations are ongoing. Uh, the Buenos Aires meeting will be an important uh, opportunity to advance all these debates and ensure that more economic opportunities reach uh, um, as many people as possible. Uh, so fostering this greater inclusivity is one of the most pressing challenges of our age. Uh, the solutions are not evident, uh, but we cannot uh, avoid the discussion. We cannot shy away from this discussion, and we cannot make believe that it doesn't exist. Um, Multi-stakeholder approaches like the Global Deal uh, can make an important contribution here. I really look forward uh, to continue this collaboration uh, with the Swedish government in tackling these issues, exploring uh, the continued contribution that trade and the WTO can make. So thank you all very much. I'm really looking forward to hear uh, what the panelists have to add to this conversation. And uh, thank you all uh, for coming and, and being here with us today. Director General. Director General, Prime Minister, thank you very much indeed. Allow me to uh, let you leave the stage. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we are clear that there is, uh, first of all, uh, no one solution, no one solution is or set of solutions is being proposed anyway uh, by the Global Deal. Uh, what we're looking at is what we were hearing uh, just now from the Director General is perhaps a series of solutions which are relevant um, to each, um, each individual country. Um, if you're finding it difficult to hear either what I'm saying or the translation, do make sure that you use your headphones. Um, and also to say that if you would like um, to tweet, the hashtag Global Deal is available to you to do that. So let me introduce the next panellist to you, who I think are making their way to the stage. Hi, Mark. There's no stopping the Brits, is there? Um, so to my left here, Mark Pearson, uh, Director D D Deputy Director of Employment, Labour and Social Affairs at the OECD. Sabina Dewan, who is uh, President and Executive Director of Just Jobs Network, and Professor Jens Sudikum, who is from Heinrich Heine University in Dusseldorf. Uh, welcome to you all. As I said at the start, I think our plan now really is to look at um, what it is that we're experiencing in different parts of the world and then move on to the second panel and get a little bit more specific about what solutions apply where. And then we know where we're heading uh, with what the Global Deal can offer us. So, um, Jens, allow me to um, call on you first. I know that you've done extensive research on the subject of the fallout and where we experience this social inequality widening um, and we're going to talk to you first about in the more developed economies and then come to Sabina if we may to talk about uh, developing economies. So uh, Jens, first to you. Yeah, so thanks Tanya. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, um, Director General, I'm very pleased to be invited to this, to this very high level and great event and uh, so you're going to find a draft that Sabina and I have put together um, and I think the paper it should be in front of you on the table and the point that we try to make in this uh, joint paper is um, that trade creates enormous benefits uh, actually to an extent that it has the potential to make everybody better off but the very important insight is this doesn't happen automatically it requires in our view uh, a comprehensive and complementary set of policies to make sure that the gains from globalization and trade are actually widely shared across the society. Um, and as an economist, so I'm an economic theorist, I should say that this message is actually uh, not very new. So it's integral part actually of uh, traditional economic textbooks um, that trade liberalization policies and trade also require uh, complementary policies that distribute the gains because this is something that the market does not generate and deliver uh, on itself. So uh, as consumers, 
we virtually all benefit from trade um, because trade generates so many new, better, cheaper products. It fosters innovation, it generates economic growth. But especially on the labor market, the situation is more complex. So on the labor market, there are groups that also enormously benefit from trade in terms of higher wages and earnings. But they're also, and I'm talking here uh, especially about the developed countries, so for example, the United States or European countries, there are also groups where on the labor market the effects of trade um, are more problematic and adverse because trade um, generates at the individual level strong adjustment costs, it generates change and uh, it generates the need for individuals to adjust and adapt to this change and uh, it has effects on uh, wages and factor prices which can be such that some individuals actually see stagnating wages as a result of trade. So now uh, the textbook model strongly suggests that because there's this overall um, welfare gain from trade, there is the potential, so the cake is growing, so there's the potential that no individual portion actually has to shrink. But as I said, this doesn't happen automatically. It requires action uh, by stakeholders to make sure that no individual portion shrinks. And uh, the question is which policies um, can actually ensure um, this sharing of the gains uh, in a broad sense across society, right? If you take it literal, then this redistribution would mean passive monetary transfers, for example, via the tax system. But uh, I agree very much uh, with the World Trade Report and with what uh, Dr. General Azevedo has just said, that the labor market uh, is really key in this discussion and the labor market policies should be really seen as an integral part uh, responsible for um, sharing the gains of globalization. So we know there's abundant evidence uh, from various countries now that trade shocks can actually lead at the individual level to job displacements and individual workers may find it really difficult to transition to different jobs, to new jobs in different sectors of the economy. And any effort, be it from public policies or from firms or from unions that actually help facilitate this transition into new jobs for example, through retraining, um, through qualification, lifelong learning efforts, is something that will actually be very helpful to uh, share the gains from globalization very broadly. And let me, that, that's my last point, um, emphasize one particular aspect that I find important, and that's not so present in the discussion about this. We know there is evidence that the adverse effects of trade on the labor markets, that they tend to be concentrated very often in particular regions within countries, um, because industries and sectors, they are not uh, you know, distributed equally across space. They tend to concentrate in particular regions. And so the, the negative consequences, um, these job displacements, the reduced wages, they are much more pressing in some regions. So I'm thinking, for example, of the American Rust Belt, the industrial areas of northern England or the Ruhr area in Germany, where I'm coming from. And uh, when you look at recent election results, right, these votes for um, you know, protectionist policy agendas or populism, they tended to be much stronger in these regions where the adverse labor market effects uh, were concentrated. So uh, I think labor market policies are a very important part um, of the answer that policy should give and stakeholders should give. But we also have to recognize this regional dimension, right? Because the adaption to shocks would require uh, also regional mobility so that people are also willing to move uh, to different regions. And we know that this is very difficult, uh, especially for the groups um, who stand to uh, lose most uh, on the labor market from the adverse consequences. So I think, and that would be my, uh, my policy statement, um, I think we should um, view regional policies as an important complement to this effort of labor market policies and really think of this as also being an important part of the overall policy package uh, that needs to be um, put in place to share the benefits of globalization. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Jens. Um, so that's really a comment on, on what's happened in the uh, more industrialized or developed economies. And as you say, uh, it is quite evident in the rural. I was there quite recently in Essen. Um, yeah. Um, where you do see exactly this happening. Uh, Sabina, if I could turn to you and ask you a little bit what, what, what you're seeing in other parts of the world. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, I just want to start by thanking Prime Minister Lovin for the invitation to be here today, Director General Acevedo, and I would be remiss not to recognize the former Foreign Minister of Norway, Borga Brende, whose government provided my organization the seed funding to exist, so thank you. <laughs> um, it's a privilege to be here. 
Um, and Tanya, thank you for your excellent question and my co-author uh, on the paper, Professor Jens, and I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name. <laughs> I, <laughs> I have uh, three quick com comments that I'd like to make. Um, I wanted to start by underscoring the need for an honest narrative on trade. Let it be clear, I am a firm believer in the benefits of trade. But we cannot deny, as Jens just mentioned, we cannot deny that trade comes with a restructuring of economic activity that leaves some workers better off, some workers with jobs, while others lose them. It raises the wages for some workers and leads to a decline or, or stagnation of wages for others. Trade is complicated, but it is anything but free. Its benefits come at a cost. And unless we start by acknowledging the costs of trade, we cannot fix trade. Um, and what we will see is a continuation of the decline and, and waning of public support for trade. So I think the first thing that we need to do is to acknowledge um, both the positives and the costs of trade across the developed and developing world and craft an honest narrative. And from this flows my second point, which is we've heard a lot this morning, and I think that the pervasive view among policymakers and scholars and practitioners is that the costs of trade are a redistribution problem. That if we just create domestic policies like trade adjustment assistance or social security, social safety nets, social protection, however you'd like to call the set of policies, if we just do that, then the benefits of trade will be widely distributed and everything will be okay. I think that that is a deeply flawed assumption. Um, redistribution is important, but before redistribution, we must actually think about how trade is structured and governed to begin with. We live in an era of value chains. Um, World trade in intermediate goods is now greater than all non-oil traded goods put together. 80% um, of global trade measured in gross exports is now linked to the production of multinational firms. Take an iPhone, for example. Designed by Apple in Cupertino, assembled by Foxconn, a Taiwanese company based in China, components from over 700 suppliers across over 30 countries. We live in an era of global value chains and trade is increasingly uh, exchange among corporate entities determined by their bottom line governed by the private law of contracts. So how do we govern this form of trade? And how do we reinforce the value of work and the value of workers and keep the asymmetries of power in check? How do we institute new regulations and, and transparency in this 21st century uh, you know, landscape of global value chains and trade through global value chains? Unless we answer these questions, focusing on redistribution is uh, addressing the symptom, not the cause. And finally, I'll just, if you'll allow me one more minute, just to make, um, make a point about where I think the Global Deal can make a really significant contribution. This is an ex excellent opportunity. The Global Deal is an excellent opportunity to chart a new path forward, to break from business as usual. I think first, we must devise a real and provocative research agenda. And I underscore the word provocative. We must not sacrifice nuance, and we must not sacrifice an honest narrative for the sake of political correctness. Political correctness is for us in this room. The average person out there doesn't look at political correctness. They look at how this transforming world with technology and value chains and climate change is affecting their ability to provide for themselves and their families. So let's move beyond political correctness and come up with a real research agenda around trade and the way that it's affecting people's lives. Um, so once we have this research agenda, we must operationalize this research agenda, not just by working with multilateral institutions and with tripartite 
partners and multinationals, that's extremely important, but we must also equally work with grassroots organizations, civil society, small businesses in Global Deal partner countries on the ground to see how integration into value chains is really playing out on the ground. Um, and it's critical to understand these issues before we can figure out how to treat them and to form real partnerships um, and social dialogue in communities, in cities, at the local level, in global deal countries. Thank you. Sabina, thank you very much. I think it's becoming clear that the causes of growing inequality and therefore probably the solutions are uh, manifold. Uh, trade, of course, is something that we all want to continue to do. There's an enormous impetus behind increasing um, trade flows um, and internationalizing trade. Also, labor market flexibility. So how possibly can they sit along the other problems that we have, which is growing inequality, also the growth of technology and um, in many countries, an ageing working force or an ageing population, I should say. Uh, Mark, perhaps what could you uh, add to that discussion to uh, perhaps try to reduce its complexity? Great. Well, yes, thank you very much. And indeed, thank you very much to the Swedish Prime Minister for this brilliant initiative of the Global Deal. I think that's opening up the possibilities of having a proper conversation internationally about these issues. Uh, and yes, Tanya, you're quite right. We're not just talking about one megatrend. We're talking about three incredibly important megatrends going on at the same time. Yes, trade, wonderful. We have the globalization, the opportunity to sell products, to buy products uh, from all around the world. That should be making us richer. We have uh, technology, which should be vastly increasing our ability to, to produce goods and services. And we have population ageing, so we're living longer. We have more opportunities to, to take advantage of what should be this increase in consumption. And yet, we look at our outcomes and we're in a mess. We're not using those megatrends and turning them into better living standards. Certainly not better living standards for all. We have higher unemployment in some countries. We have sluggish, sluggish wages due to low productivity growth, job insecurity, uh, and poor quality jobs. And so we're not managing to turn the advantages of those megatrends into what we need for people. And I'm not surprised, therefore, that we're seeing backlash against globalization. E even in a country such as, say, Denmark, if you look at people who lose their jobs due to technology or trade, and you follow their incomes, even after five years, on average, those people have not yet got back up to the income that they had before they lost their job. In a country like the UK, on average, after five years, you're 30% poorer than before you lost your job. So displacement due to trade or technology is something that people are right to be suspicious about, because it might be making the economy better off, but it's not making the individuals affected better off, or at least not all of them. And I think that's the real challenge we've got. Uh, taking all those trends together, what we're seeing, it's not exactly that we're seeing fewer low-skilled jobs and more high-skilled jobs. In fact, we're seeing more low-skilled jobs and more high-skilled jobs. The jobs that we're losing are the jobs in the middle. The good jobs, the jobs that most people could aspire to, you don't need to have a fantastic level of intelligence, but you could imagine that you'd have a good standard of living. And in developed countries, those jobs are going relatively rapidly. Now, what's the consequences of that? One of the consequences we've already heard is this widening in income inequality. So, you know, three decades ago, top 10% in rich countries were earning seven times as much as the, top, as the bottom 10%. Now, 10 times as much. But it goes way beyond just inequality. If you look at countries like, say, the United States or Canada, before the economic crisis, and you asked people if they were middle class or lower class or upper class, 70% of people in North America were saying that they were middle class. You ask them now, it's down to 50%. And I think that's a sign of the loss of confidence in the economy, the loss of confidence in the future. 
we do lots of statistical analysis about whether it's trade that causes this, uh, these changes or technology. For what it's worth, our most recent study suggests it's mainly technology driving these changes rather than trade. I think it's a bit of an artificial discussion, however. I mean, the reason why firms introduce net new technologies is because they want to trade. Uh, they want to become richer. So you can't really separate these things out. I think we need to, to treat them together as mega trends that are affecting the labour market. And for sure, the response, yes, I absolutely agree with what people have been saying. We do need to look at our domestic policies. We need a much better inclusive growth approach, which involves education, involves better health policies, better adaption when people actually do get displaced from jobs. I do think it goes beyond that, though. I don't think that we should stop at just saying this is a problem for domestic policies. And this is really coming to, to what Sabina said, I, uh, which I agree with. We need to have an honest con conversation about trade. We need to have an honest conversation about other aspects of the international system. W will we really get inclusive growth if we don't address the issue of tax evasion and tax avoidance? Mm. Will we really get inclusive growth and confidence in the international system if we don't start looking at international labour standards or corruption uh, and, and responsible business conduct? I mean, this is an area where the OECD has done a, a lot of work to try and get some sort of responsibility for the entire value chain of companies that are based in a developed country so that they do actually have some sort of responsibility about labour standards right the way through the, uh, the value chain, right the way down into the countries where they do the production. So I think, yes, certainly we need to do an awful lot in the domestic sphere, but let's not forget all this huge international agenda that we must address, and I really hope that we can address this as part of the global deal going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let me just um, ask you, Jens, very uh, briefly, and if I just get some brief answers. If we are to assume that um, there is enormous momentum behind the desire to continue uh, to promote free trade um, and also to maintain flexible working conditions, would it be enough to try to address this problem broadly, and now I'm talking about the more developed economies, would it be enough to say to companies, look, you cannot pay uh, the people at the top of the company multiple times, several hundreds maybe, uh, what you pay people uh, at the bottom of the company. If you, um, if you think that your company is changing because of technology, you must take a commitment to train people to prepare for that and, and, and address these problems and leave the fundamental, uh, the fundamental drive towards, the more, towards more technology in an open world absolutely um, unbridled. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I think this is a very important point. Um, all the, what has been called domestic policies, um, I would say, I mean, that's much broader. It's not just public policies that um, is important, but also efforts of firms and unions and stakeholders in the labor market. And coming to this point uh, about retraining and qualification, I think that's where firms and unions play a very vital role, right? Because um, you can think of this as being an insurance mechanism. Um, I very much agree with, uh, with Mark uh, saying about the really adverse effects of job displacement. Um, so firms, uh, if they already, before the displacement occurs, right, so in the good times, train their workforce, mm -hmm. right, so that's something that is beneficial to the firms, right, it pays off, but it's also beneficial for the workers in the negative or in the case of a job loss because it helps him or her adapt and move back quicker into better jobs. So I think um, this retraining effort is really something um, where not only the, the government plays a very important role, but uh, all actors in the labour market can contribute to really have this, this inclusive growth approach. And Sabina, Mark brought up the idea of um, tax avoidance. That's something that we've uh, spent a lot of time thinking about in the UK, or how to stop people doing it, rather. Um, and also um, the idea um, that governments have a role to play really in, um, I think, this, this idea of uh, re-education and anticipating uh, trends. Again, do you, how powerful, and corruption, of course, how powerful in stopping corruption, how powerful would those initiatives be in trying to address this problem? Well, I, I couldn't agree with Mark Moore. I think that we have to look at all of these different aspects. Um, if we look at tax avoidance um, in India, where I live, 
less than 3% of the population actually pays income tax. So I don't know how you build an infrastructure, a social infrastructure in a country where you just don't have, simply have the resources. Um, but I, I think that we have to take tax corruption and re-education differently. So I, my organization, we do a lot of work on workforce development and skills. And one of the, the points that I always like to make there is that skills is not a panacea to addressing all the changes that are that are confronting our economies today. It's an important part of the equation. But you tell me how you skill 356 million people between the ages of 10 and 24 in India alone, in India alone, that do not even have a requisite level of education. A three month, six month, or a year long training program does not prepare them for any kind of economic mobility or you know, dealing with um, building a livelihood for themselves. So we really need to balance these sort of short-term measures with the longer-term continued investments in anti-corruption, tax avoidance, so that we can have better solid education and health in these countries as well. Mark, do you think there is a broad acceptance by governments, perhaps in faster growing economies? I remember when I lived in the States um, in between 2003, 2006, there was a general view, and this of course just ahead of the financial crisis, uh, there was a general view um, and a general expression, an incoming tide lifts all boats. We know that not to be the case, and the financial crisis has exacerbated that particular problem. Do you think governments now are prepared to be less focused on economic growth at any cost and look now at this business of tax avoidance that we see in many countries, probably all countries of the world, and also the question of corruption and basic levels of education. Well, I don't think that's an anti-growth strategy that you've talked about, actually. No, it isn't, that's... but I wonder if, it, with, with there is a greater, of course not, but there, there's been this greater focus on, oh, well, look, it doesn't matter because the economy is growing. Let's not worry too much about these little details. These little details have now become paramount. Yeah, I, I get you. I, I think that's, that's right. I mean, I think we are also just struggling with the fact that people no longer trust governments as much as they used to to be yeah. doing the right thing. And so we do have to take seriously what we, the authors talked about, having an open dialogue about trade. It's an open dialogue really about where our economies are growing. No, I don't think that it's acceptable in many countries uh, as it was before to see companies go around engaging in corrupt business practices, for example. So I think there has been a move, a, a greater willingness for, for countries to start addressing these issues. I say start addressing because, you know, you, you mentioned the UK. The UK is starting to address tax avoidance and evasion. Yes, I think that's right, starting. Boy, there's a long way to go if we look at an awful lot of countries to actually start putting into practice the, the international agreements that are in place. A lot more needs to be done here. So it's not, I don't think, that we're looking, scrabbling around for new policies in many areas. What we're actually wanting to do is to see a little bit more action on the mm. areas where we know that we need to make progress. Right. Well, I think that's an excellent uh, lift-off point to move on to our next panel. Please allow me to thank Professor Jens Sudikum. Sabina, Sudikum. Uh, Sabina uh, Dewan, President of Executive Director of Just Jobs, and Mark Pearson. Thank you. Right, so um, let's move on very swiftly because I'm aware, aware that I'm um, not doing my job properly because I'm allowing time to slip. Uh, Guy Ryder, please, uh, the Director General of the International Labour Organization. Uh, please uh, come up and Abdul Fattah, who, uh, uh, has, or Mr. Hassan, who is the Minister of Labour and Social Affairs in Ethiopia. Uh, Bob Brenda, uh, the President of the World Economic Forum. Uh, Pierre Habar, who is the Acting General Secretary of the Trade Union Advisory Committee to the OECD, and Joachim Reiter, who is Group External Affairs Director at Vodafone Group. Welcome to you all and thanks uh, for joining us. Guy, I'm going to start with um, you on um, my right here. Um, we were hearing um, a little earlier uh, that um, there is this very delicate balance between uh, labour market flexibility, uh, which companies um, always seek, and the need for uh, fairness. How do you square that circle? Thank you very much, Tanya. Very, very... Can I ask all of you to turn up your mics? Is this, are you having a problem hearing us all? 
because that's really frustrating and I'm really sorry. <coughs> so we're all going to press plus here and hope that nothing goes dramatically wrong. <laughs> yep, could you press the plus sign? Not on the headphones, but on the mic thing. Is that better? Yes? Good, yes. Okay, Guy. Alternatively, I could just shout a bit. You can, um, shout. You can uh, shout. Firstly, Tanya, uh, and to the organisers, thank you very much for including us in this very uh, important conversation. You've asked me to say something about this vexed issue of flexibility. Yep. I've been struck by uh, the, the previous panel and what was said in the introductions uh, that the term flexibility has been thrown about um, in, in meaning rather different things, actually. And I think it's important that we try to distinguish what we mean when we talk about flexibility. Uh, some occasions we talk about uh, the flexibility of an economy. I think I would rather talk about the adaptability of an economy, the capacity of an economy to move, particularly in the uh, context of our current discussion, uh, um, to move to react to the opportunities and, of course, the challenges which arise from uh, trade and from trade uh, changes in trade regimes. In that regard, I would argue that the best guarantor of what I would call adaptability is dialogue. Is dialogue. It is a capacity uh, of governments to sit with their employer community and their trade unions and talk their way through to the right types of solutions in that sense of adaptability. And of course, that is where the value, I think, of the global dialogue is particularly evident. There's another uh, meaning to the term flexibility, labour market flexibility in its more pure form, uh, where we tend to see, wrongly in my view, a playoff between flexibility of labour markets on one side and labour standards and conditions of work on the other. This is a false uh, conundrum because the successful economies, the economies that have done it well, and you'll think I'm sucking up to the Prime Minister if I cite Sweden, but why not do it? Uh, Sweden is one of the countries which has both uh, ensured the right types of flexibility in its labour markets with very high quality employment conditions. So I would argue against the notion that this is a zero sum, that you have to do more flexibility at the cost of good jobs or vice versa. It is not like that. We've heard Roberto say this morning, and he's absolutely right, there is no one-size-fits-all solution. It's not wise people sitting in Geneva or New York or anybody else which is going to dictate the right way to move. Uh, each country needs to find uh, the right solutions to its circumstances. It takes you back to dialogue, doesn't it? It takes you back to the need for dialogue. You know, on the basis that dialogue is a good way, I think, of coming up with the right types of balances, it's a good way to make people feel involved in processes, you know, if you're involved in a discussion, however difficult it can be, you're much more likely to accept uh, the outcome as legitimate. Sort of on the principle that if you're not at the table, you're likely to be on the menu. People want to be involved in the dialogue process. Now, I think the global dialogue can help us forward uh, in two uh, arena, if you like. One is the national arena, and it is encouraging to see more and more countries signing up uh, to the, uh, the global deal. Uh, and we can say a great deal more about that. But arising from the conversation uh, that has taken place here in the WTO this morning, I think we need also to improve dialogue in the international system. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean. A number of colleagues have talked about the need for, uh, I'll use their phrase, an honest dialogue about trade. I would say a credible dialogue about trade. I do not wish to impugn people's intentions. But we have been stuck, I fear, in a sort of a binary discussion over the last, well, probably as long as the WTO has existed, if I can be honest, a discussion which tends to be, or not a discussion, two parallel discourses between those who have acted, excuse my language, as the cheerleaders of trade liberalisation, and not really gone beyond that, and those others, and we're seeing the growth of that, who are now saying, actually, trade is not the way. Trade liberalisation, open trading system is not the way we want to go. The rise of populism. So you've got two irreconcilable discourses here. The credible dialogue has to take place somewhere in the middle, which is being honest, credible, to say, yep, as everybody has agreed here, trade is the engine of growth and greater prosperity. 
But no, it is not automatic. And if it's not automatic that those gains are shared sufficiently broadly, what do we have to do? What do we have to do? And a lot of the answer lies in labor markets. But as we've heard already this morning, it lies also in many other areas of policy intervention. And something I think we've done very badly over the last 20 or 30 years is to have this integrated policy approach. Those of you who are old enough to remember the Singapore conference of the WTO know that at least in terms of labor and trade, we agreed to go our separate ways. And for reasons which we all know about and they're sensitive, but it's actually time, time to bring back an integrated approach to international policy making. We have the framework for doing that in the form of the United Nations 2030 development agenda. I think we have to learn the lessons from that. And I think the global dialogue can help that international dialogue as much as it can help all those series of national dialogues that we need to see growing. Right. Thank you very much. So on the subject of national dialogues, we've already established that solutions are very different for very different countries and, and, uh, and um, very different situations. Uh, so let me um, turn over to now to Mr. Hassan, who is the Minister of Labour and Social Affairs of Ethiopia, a country that has embraced enormous amounts of technology and development very, very, uh, very, very quickly. Over to you. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, can I, I, so I'm just going to interrupt you again. If you can't hear, there's one of these somewhere under your desk. <clears throat> Stick it on, and I think that will help you hear better. Okay. <laughs> Apparently, that technology works. Good. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, His Excellency Prime Minister Stephen for inviting Ethiopia to be part of this very important forum. Um, to begin with. Uh, we live in an increasingly globalized world where interrelations determine the future of nations, where technological change is becoming ever more rapid, where international successes affect all aspects of national, economic, political, and social life. In this world, countries have to confront both opportunities as well as challenges so as not to be left behind. Therefore, in this regard, with the global deal plays is a very important role, uh, which corresponds to the concern of our nations, especially in a country like Ethiopia. And it, it will also contribute to strengthen the common efforts that can change the impact of globalization on our socioeconomic uh, performance. We can benefit a lot from this global partnership uh, as it focuses on enhancing social dialogue and the sound industrial relations. Um, in our continuous efforts and uh, commitment towards uh, achieving sustainable development goals and sustainable and social uh, development, Ethiopia attaches greater importance uh, to social dialogue and tripart tripartism. We have uh, ratified most of the core conventions of the International Labour Organization and also the Tripartite Convention uh, Number 1 and Number 144, 1976. We have a well-organized tripartite uh, structure whereby the government, employers, workers, organizations come together to discuss the issues of social dialogue and decent work. The government of Ethiopia, above all, recognized that, recognizes that improved labor uh, administration and the labor relations lead to better working conditions. In this regard, uh, as a country, we are committed uh, to maintain a harmonious and a stable labor relations. So I think a uh, global deal also can contribute to the existing uh, standards and the systems that we had. And it will serve as a global uh, forum where we can deepen our uh, experiences and also share some, some, some other values. Perhaps the most uh, difficult task will be uh, to develop greater organizational capacity because without capacity it will be very difficult for, for any country to actually benefit from, from the globalization so uh, the, the capacity of employers the capacity of workers and not just uh, to bring about a change but also that will, will, will also uh, enhance their, their capacity to manage uh, change eradicating also poverty is also another uh, very important issue and uh, also uh, in order to, to sustain uh, development, uh, which is also 
uh, our of, of riding concern and uh, also uh, contribute to the, to the well-being of the, the society. I think uh, uh, the issue of uh, uh, eradicate, eradicating poverty is very important in a country like Ethiopia. Uh, we have we are of the view that uh, the effective cooperation and the partnership among important actors in the multilateral system is central to collective efforts of all. And I think uh, it will also ensure uh, the implementation of the Agenda 2030, uh, that's the Sustainable Development Goals. We also recognize the importance of global and the strong national ownership of the Sustainable Development Goals as a key element to the realization of the transformational agenda. Ethiopia in this respect welcomes the efforts being made by the Global Deal in line with the uh, goals of the Sustainable Development Goals, specifically Goal 8, Goal 10 and uh, also Goal 17. Mm. Uh, just to share some views in relation uh, to the trade aspects, we recognize that sustainable trade and investment and also broad-based inclusive economic growth highly require the environment where internationally recognized worker rights are protected. In order to incorporate trade aspects uh, in the Global Deal initiative, we are of the view that we need to work towards increasing coordination between labor and also trade authorities. And we need to link trade policies with labor policies as well. The final point, which is the way forward, I would like to, to, to raise some two important issues. We believe that our determination and the seriousness to cope with an open world rely on the strength, strength of our institutions of social dialogue. Without social dialogue, it will be very difficult for, 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 for the world to, to benefit from the uh, interventions of trade. Uh, clearly, the workers, the employers, and the government working together have a key role to play in building the institutions that can sustain democracy in our societies as well. Finally, uh, tripartite arrangement should also be examined in light of the emerging globalization of the world economy. And within the existing realities in each country, as has been said earlier, there is no one size fits for all formula. It is actually up to the countries to, 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 to tailor and uh, to develop their policies. There is also a need to increase our, co co our commitment to better coordination of trade and labor policies, as I said earlier. Thank you, Zoma. Thank you very much. So these are one of the issues that I want to, to, to contribute. Don't turn your mic off. We might want to talk to you a bit later on. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Borga, uh, you're now um, heading up the uh, World Economic Forum. So it's a very good uh, meeting point uh, for people from all sorts of different nationalities and uh, parts of uh, the, this partnership, companies and so on, NGOs, governments. Uh, so you've only been a very short time in the job, to, but just to force you to hit the ground running, uh, what, what, is, what is popping out to you as some of the solutions Solutions that might be at hand here, some of the uh, low-hanging fruit, I suppose you could say. Thank you, Tanya. Um, thank you to Prime Minister Stefan Levin um, for your initiative when it comes um, also to um, this uh, grand deal, um, fair deal, and also to um, Director General Roberto Azevedo. Uh, for the important role of WTO uh, in this. I, I think part of the solution, Tanya, is in this room and this building, because what we tend to forget is that um, the multilateral uh, trading system is a prerequisite also uh, for a fair deal. Um, if all countries uh, don't have the same access to the markets, mm. and if countries are not treated uh, in a fair way, uh, then we really will not succeed. The multilateral system uh, secures uh, that not only the big players will decide everything, but also that smaller and medium-sized countries are part of this. And uh, this is so important to know protect. And I have to say I also um, saw uh, the financial crisis unfolding in 2008. Um, it is uh, uh, the big recession in many ways, but it did not end into a depression. 
that could have easily have happened if we were not coming together, first in the G20 context with massive uh, fiscal stimulus, against some economists' advice, and also an extraordinary unorthodox monetary policy. But on top of it, the WTO was a bulwark against um, protectionism, because it's very easy when you see these kind of challenges to say, no, we'll just protect myself and we will stop trading. We avoided that because we had um, the rules and regulations by the WTO. And I have to say that we, we, we tried that uh, solution of uh, going into protectionism in the 30s. So the reaction after 29 was beggar your neighbor, and then we saw the global GDP fell with 25%. The global trade fell with 50% in three, four years, and we got massive unemployment, massive unemployment. So I think based on that, we have to also moving forward in Buenos Aires and other areas, we have, in my view, to strengthen the WTO and the international trade rules and regulations. But I think that in the future, we also have to make sure that the trade rules also open up for necessary domestic policy space. And uh, Stefan, the Prime Minister of Sweden, mentioned this, that you also have to use that space in your own country to make sure that you address some of the new challenges that this fourth industrial revolution is causing, uh, this um, also globalization leads to. And I think the Nordic countries, of course I'm not objective, but I think that what the Nordic countries have done is that you have this flexi security. You have upheld the labor standards and the salaries, but a company in the Nordic countries know that if you are losing a lot of money and you have to close down. That can happen. Then you can do that and the state takes the responsibility then to move someone away from one area of business to another one. But if you as a company know that you will, uh, even if you're losing a lot of money, bleeding, you cannot change because you have to stick to this. That is a kind of uh, situation that also make it harder to employ people. Mm. You will not see um, willingness to employ young people. Um, and you know, we should not forget that domestic policies still do matter. Argentina was the richest country in the world after the Second World War. It was not that after 15 years it took to change economic realities. My country, I, I will not start a competition with Sweden here, but my, comp my country, Norway, was the poorest in Europe 120 years ago together with Iceland and Ireland. 800,000 left for the US. Today, Norway is not in that category, but we built out uh, education for every child. 99% of our children are still in governmental schools. We build a robust tax system, the ownership to gas, uh, oil, and also hydro uh, was mainly um, administered also by the government, but we still have a very competitive uh, economy. I think we can uh, be inspired of some of these policies. And this is also uh, the World Economic Forum's competitiveness report that comes out every year. It also puts those countries um, scoring quite high that also are upholding labor standards, that are using a lot of resources on uh, education. Even competitive countries have marginal taxes close to 50%, but it is about how do you invest these tax revenues? Do they go uh, to the people of the country? Are they invested uh, in the right way? Then coming back to the bigger picture, you know, what are we faced with on this globalization picture? We are moving from 7 billion people today to 10 billion in 2050. Imagine just all the jobs that have to be created. We still need global growth. Without global growth, we will not have these jobs created. The global trade system 
with WTO has also opened up for countries that were poor to enter the global market. We should not forget that. That's created challenges in some of the developed countries, but in the middle-income countries, this has created enormous opportunities. And as was also said um, by uh, someone here, that 70% of the jobs that we are seeing, seeing gone now in the US or also in Europe are related to technological changes. 30% is due to the competition. I don't think in the future we can uh, stop or should stop uh, competition or this globalization, but we have to look at those policies that are necessary to make the growth more inclusive, sustainable, and job creating. That's why also the World Economic Forum has convened groups looking at sustainable investment dialogues. We are also uh, part of this global alliance for trade facilitation, making sure that developing countries can take part of this because their challenge is that they're under globalized. And then we also have to have an inclusive global value chain platform, and this is what we are inserting. I could have gone on, but I, I see you're getting a little bit anxious, so thank you. I always look anxious, that's just yeah. the weather. That's your job. That's my job, to be anxious. Uh, yeah, um, so you advise the OECD, Pierre, on the um, issues of trade unions. What advice are you giving right now? <laughs> uh, well, actually, uh, the TRAC bring a voice to the OECD, the voice of organized labor, of National Trade Union Confederation. Uh, and we spent quite a lot of time whispering at the ears, both of the OECD staff, the OECD Secretariat, and member states. Let me perhaps first uh, thank uh, Stefan Lerman and the Swedish government for, uh, for launching this initiative. Rest assured that the labor movement firmly supports the global deal. And for a simple reason, it's actually part of our own business to do social dialogue. That's why we're here. That's why we are here at the local level, at national level, and at the international level. And we will do our best to mobilize all the stakeholders, including business groups, to join this initiative. Three remarks uh, that I will share with you. I'm lucky because I'm coming at the end of this uh, conversation this morning, so I, I can uh, do some mini wrap up in the time that is allocated uh, with you. Uh, on the global governance system first, um, Guy Ryder mentioned that, in fact, we are celebrating for good or for bad, important events that was held in nine, end of 96 and, and in 97. Uh, the, ministerial, the, the first WTO ministerial in Singapore in December 96. I was not there, but I took the time to read the transcript of the preparatory meeting that trade unions were organizing a weeks before, weeks before this important ministerial. And we were very confident, we were fairly confident that in Singapore we would obtain a deal for better cooperation at the middle, for a mechanism between the WTO and the, and the ILO. Obviously, we did not get that. And without go dwelling into detail, that was a bit of a traumatic mo moment for, for the labor movement. Perhaps it being a, 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 a moment where a, a part of the labor movement changes position, change position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis trade. Six months later, in Paris, the OECD failed to, uh, to come up with an agreement on a multilateral uh, uh, investment agreement, the, uh, the MAI. And this time, it, it went the other round. It was an initiative to strengthen governance, to strengthen uh, um, coherence within not a global level, not a global level, but a fairly uh, important size uh, of the economy. And it failed because perhaps, and for sure, in fact, this was an agreement that did not respect all the stakeholders uh, 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 of trade, of investment. Uh, I did not take due account of the right to, to regulate. So that was 20 years ago. So my, our, from a trade perspective, clearly we have an incomplete uh, governance system. Uh, we are, uh, and for sure the way f further would be to what Gaira mentioned, uh, a robust and credible com new renewed conversation between this house and the ILO, but also perhaps indeed other institutions, tax was mentioned, 60% of trade happens within multinational enterprises. The, how that wealth is distributed is depending on transfer pricing guidelines. Tax matters uh, not only for, uh, to, to fund uh, public services, it also matters to ensure a fair uh, distribution of wealth created by trade, or at least by these 60% of trade that happens within multinational enterprises. A second message I will share with you from a trading perspective is 
what is the model that we want on the domestic front. We agree no one size fits all. We are not all Swedish, okay? But I think we all agree that there are some pretty good best practices that we can share uh, from, uh, for, uh, from the Nordic country. Particularly this idea, and I'm quoting again Guy, but this idea that this is not a zero sum game uh, that, we, uh, uh, that we are dealing with. How to improve? I must say, uh, from the labor perspective, <coughs> we are not necessarily too enthusiastic with a model that would boil down to compensate to the losers in a vast creative destruction game, you know, with a bit more social safety net, uh, a bit more redistribution. We need more than that. So part of the solution is indeed more skills, more access to skills, 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 as the OECD would say. But okay, that's good. But we don't think that's actually tackling the issue of workers in Foxconn, uh, in the supply chain of, uh, of Samsung. These are people, they need for sure more skills, but they need first and foremost respect for basic occupational health and safety standards. If they need skills, it's skills to, for the right to organize collectively. So our basic message perhaps on the domestic front is that, yes, why not engage a conversation on flexibility in fact? It's true that from labor movements, it's not necessarily a word that we like. But what we'll say is simply, let's have flexibility that is negotiated, that negotiated between the stakeholders, between employers and unions, and flexibility that is collectively organized, that is collectively uh, 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 managed. And this is where the initiative of the Global Deal has an important, perhaps, message, is to whether you use the word adaptability, adjustment, or flexibility, it's something that has to be negotiated between the key stakeholders of, uh, of, of the company. Uh, and that obviously would include this in a context where, you know, whether you like it or not, there is an erosion of the bargaining power of one party in this business, which is workers. And there is a very clear indicator of that. It's the gap between productivity increase and, and wage increase. So on the domestic front, no one size fits all but you need to, to, to reverse this trend towards the transfer of risk from employers onto workers and the individualization of risk. And to reconsider this notion, yes, we need to adapt, yes, we need to be innovative, but this has to be negotiated collectively. And we have the tools, collective bargaining agreements, firm level, collective bargain uh, agreement at sector-wide agreement that's essential to ensure level playing field uh, and uh, fairly good uh, individual employment protection legislation. The third message is to bring this opportunity to reflect a bit on, uh, on the business model that we want for the future uh, uh, and how exist the existing agenda on responsible business conduct uh, uh, can, uh, 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 can fit in that respect. It is clear that today the employer responsibility do not match the ownership of a company. The OECD, the ILO agree that if you, that an employer, a company, has a responsibility in the supply chain outside its own legal perimeter. So we have a, a uh, uh, that's the first issue. The second one is we are, with digi digitalization, facing increasing fragmentation of businesses. Uh, and this is, this brings a lot of important challenges for us, for the labor movement. How do we engage with whom? Uh, 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 who is having, uh, where do you identify the right employer responsibilities? On that front, one aspect to, be, to, to keep in mind is to strengthen further the instruments that exist that are already here. We have the ILO tripartite declaration on social policy, which was revised. We have the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. Uh, and we have a new emerging conversation on due, uh, on due uh, diligence. And beyond that, Let's also reflect again on what is a firm. There are again good examples to, uh, uh, to bring on board from Sweden, from the rest of Europe, on uh, the existence of works council, stakeholder governance, models that precisely again ensure a good balance uh, uh, of the risk and, uh, and of the benefits created by wealth, balance between the shareholders, the management and the workers. Thank you. Pierre, thank you very much. Um, so uh, let's uh, turn our thoughts now um, to the corporate sector and Joachim Reiter um, from Vodafone Group. Uh, Joachim, you've heard about um, some of the ideas being floated. How does it work 
within Vodafone Group. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, maybe I want to contextualize this a bit. And, and to be honest, uh, we actually come together here because we have a shared concern. And by and large, I think actually having listened to everyone is that we have also by and large a shared diagnosis. Now, that's a good thing. I have three messages related to that. Number one is that for the most part, um, we have discussed the challenges we're facing today, and I want to highlight what we're seeing in the future. I would like to say that Mark was absolutely right not to distinguish between trade and technology. And my message number one is we have not seen anything yet. Now, that's to some extent good news, because trade and technology are uh, providing, as the Prime Minister said, incredible force for good, empowerment of people, uh, addressing uh, persistent problems of marginalization. But, as we have also discussed, both trade and technology, and I will treat them as one, are also incredible sources of disruption. Now, if you take uh, Vodafone, we're basically one of the key uh, pipeline layers, if we can put that, for digital transformation. So we enable the digital transformation that's going around all across the world today. We're also one of the first victims of it. And therefore, I can say with some uh, comfort and with some uh, accuracy that the disruption that we're about to enter into as the digital technology is fully incorporated into the traditional sectors, like in agriculture and manufacturing, it will be a very, very different discussion that we're going to have in 10 years' time. So we need to be able to handle the, today's problem, but we also need to rig ourselves to handle uh, tomorrow's problem. So the DG Azevedo was absolutely right when he said this is unprecedented and exponential. Now, my second point is agility and adaptability is key in this future environment. And this is not agility and adaptability for the few, but for all. Now, I want to underline, in the case of Vodafone, our view is crystal clear. Inclusivity is sustainable growth, and leaving no bond behind is sustainable profitability. In other words, the fact that we are dealing with persistent and growing inequalities, both in opportunities and in outcomes of our current economic system, is not good for the corporate sector at large, just as it is not good for economies or for the individuals affected. Now, with respect to opportunities, I want to uh, underline that in our assessment, and we operate in many developing countries, particularly in some of the poorest in Africa, we see far too many people not actually having access to be able to participate in global trade and investment. This is a marginalization by the lack of opportunity, not by the fact that they've been affected by the change that has happened. They have had too little change, not too much. This includes rural communities, women, small and medium-sized companies. We have another mirror image of this problem, which is the outcomes uh, of the, or the inequality of outcomes that have come with the very rapid change and the increasing rapid change that we're seeing today. These are both of them drivers for instability and anxiety in all of our societies. The demographic dividend that we are talking about in positive terms, in terms of Africa, can very quickly, if it's not a more equality of opportunities, turn into a source of instability, frustration, and political crisis, none of which is good for the corporate sector. Now, when it comes to how we see the next step and where do we want to go forward, I think the German uh, Vodafone German CEO put it very nicely in a blog post, uh, I think it's just a few days ago actually, where it says that Vodafone is striving in every local market that we are working to establish digital social market economy. Now the word social here is absolutely crucial because it's not about <coughs> protecting companies it is about protecting people. A functioning market economy will require companies to go bust and fail. We cannot have a functioning economy if we treat all companies as Hotel California, where you check in, but you can never check out. However, uh, this implies also that technology and trade will have to be broken out of its quite narrow siloed approach and be treated as a broader societal uh, transformational issue. In our view, we work very closely in every local market uh, that we operate in to try to address what are legitimate concerns around the anxiety of the technology that we enable. Let me just highlight a few to contextualize and to be very concrete. First, skills. Second, financial inclusion. Third, health. Actually, not a lot of people know that we run one of the largest health programs in Africa for maternal health. Fourth, agricultural upgrading and SME upgrading in terms of their capabilities. Fifth, women. 
We have committed to connect an additional 60 million women by, within five years. With respect to our own staff, and this is for the societies we operate in, with respect to our own staff, absolutely correct, as the representative of the trade unions highlighted, global safety and health policy is an absolute requirement for uh, corporates today. We cannot simply accept that uh, a family in India would be worried about having their husband or wife being sent to a workplace run by Vodafone in a different manner than a family in Germany. So we have established a standard that is applicable for the same engineer irrespective of the local conditions in each of the markets we operate. We also have a global maternal program because we actually think it's absolutely crucial that women has a proper uh, career opportunity in Vodafone and are not discriminated against because uh, uh, <coughs> they are delivering children. And for that reason, despite the fact that many countries have not established good support for women as they become mothers or for fathers as they become fathers, we have uh, basically a global maternal program. It was also raised the issue of tax. We're among the few countries that already today file um, a public t tax report that indicate what we contribute in tax and jobs country by country, which is something that the EU is currently looking at. So from our point of view, we have both a local commitment in every market that we operate in, and we have a commitment to our staff. The issue around the commitment to our staff is crystal clear. We belong to the service economy. In the end, our entire success is dependent on our people. This is our foremost asset, and therefore, it makes no sense whatsoever commercially, let alone morally and ethically, to treat any of our staff uh, in a negative way or to try to exploit through short-term uh, benefits. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, <coughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, I thought it was uh, many, much of what you said very interesting there, but what leapt out to me in particular was that it is not in the interests of the corporate world to see this disparity of um, wealth and to see this inequality develop because, quite simply, you can't sell your products to uh, uh, people who are not benefiting from the development of trade. So I think that's, uh, that's very interesting. It's also not in the interest of governments to allow this to develop. It causes social disintegration um, and social unrest and um, uh, voting patterns, which which uh, governments uh, probably find difficulty with. So at the point at which you move away from something being a moral imperative, in my experience, having covered uh, business views for a long time, when it stops becoming just a moral imperative and becomes an economic one, then you start to get uh, traction on some of these problems. <coughs> um, so uh, we have a little bit of time now. We have 10 minutes. I'd like to take some questions um, from the floor. I know um, we have uh, the Canadian, uh, yes, I will come to you. I know we have the Canadian ambassador, I believe, some way he who would like to ask a question if you'd like to um is that correct oh here. you're here but you have no desire to ask a question at all <laughs> um <laughs> i'm here juncture. and i have desires to ask ask all kinds of questions but <laughs> Um, I would welcome questions from others in the room. Okay. Um, I think, uh, yes, please, if you'd like to, uh, yes, please, come, let's come to you first. If you'd like to say who you are and where you're from, please. Oui, uh, bonjour à tous. Oh, sorry, just this gentleman. I beg your pardon. Yes, I'll come to you after. I understand that you wanted to ask a question first. Yes, please. Sorry. Uh, my sorry. name is Hector Torres. I'm right now with uh, Canadian think tank CG, but I've been at the IMF and the WTO for many years. Okay, Canadian think tank, yep. yeah. What is your question, please? My question is, it has been said here several times by several speakers that uh, adjustment policies have to be defined nationally. They will respond to domestic choices, policy choices. Yes. Now, however, implementing those uh, policies may require important fiscal efforts. They may even uh, imply imposing uh, structural uh, changes that may uh, bring uh, uh, costs to the private sector. So they may affect uh, firms' competitiveness. So my question is, isn't it, those are domestic policy choices, we agree, and they have yep. to be idiosyncratic, but isn't it a bit uh, disingenuous to pretend that they could be done, this adjustment policies nationally, uh, shouldn't they be uh, implemented in a coherent uh, way 
uh, right. to, be, so, to be to because otherwise they could compound trade tensions. Yeah. Okay. So there needs to be worse. some sort of international forum, is what you're saying. Um, saying inter I would say promoting coherence in economic. Yeah. Policy should they making. be okay? So we have accepted that it's uh, not one size fits all. However, there needs to be some level of coherence. Would anybody uh, from the previous panel or this panel like to address that question? Yes, please, Borga. I'll give it a try. Um, of course, we have existing institutions like the Bretton Woods institutions uh, that uh, have partly that in their mandate, but we know the whole multilateral system, if we also then uh, focus on the UN, and for, for example, ECOSOC that could have uh, taken on uh, such a responsibility, we know that it was supposed to be the Security Council for Economic and Social Issues. We know that uh, to get consensus uh, in the UN these days, uh, we are in a polarized, fractured world, is not easy. So how to address this in a practical way? I have to say that the EU leadership uh, in this has been important. You have to also be a big enough market. I think that is your point. You have to be many players and actors coming together, addressing this, and what EU has done on competition, but also what the EU has done when it comes to addressing this tax base question. I think that's one of the elephants in the room. And of course, when you have uh, companies that get a lot of revenues from one country and um, it is uh, not having its tax base in that country, this is one of the issues that have to be discussed, and I think the EU is addressing this now heads on. Um, ideally, in an ideal world, we should also see a more multilateral approach to that. Um, that would be my preferred uh, solution. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. That's why also the World Economic Forum, with our platform being the International Organization for Public-Private Partnership, will play a role here. We invite companies, we invite civil society and governments to come together. For example, address the fourth industrial revolution. What is the societal effect of such a revolution? Will we, for the first time, address a revolution, um, a paradigm shift in that way, that are creating less jobs than more jobs? I don't hope so. Done in the right way, I think we can avoid it. But it also means, and it has, it takes savvy policies to avoid this. So uh, trade blocks might be the uh, one centre and there might be, but it, it is an interesting question. I interrupted the French ambassador. I'm extremely sorry. Please, would you like to um, give us uh, your question? Merci, Madame la Présidente. Elisabeth Laurent, ambassadeur de France. Je voudrais d'abord saluer le Premier ministre de Suède et saluer son initiative du Global Deal. Je voudrais confirmer que la France a rejoint cette initiative le 17 novembre dernier lors du sommet social de Quedeborg et comme l'a indiqué notre président de la République, nous pensons que cette initiative est exactement ce dont nos sociétés ont besoin et dont nos économies ont besoin. Alors je crois que le format de cette initiative est particulièrement intéressant. On le retrouve un peu autour des panélistes dans cette salle, avec cette association d'organisations internationales, en particulier l'OIT et l'OCDE, mais aussi les entreprises. Je crois que ce n'est pas si fréquent qu'il faut le noter et que cela va nous permettre d'aller de l'avant. Je crois aussi que ce qui est important pour nous, c'est que dans cette démarche, on intègre pleinement la question de la promotion des standards de dialogue social dans le monde, car pour nous, le dialogue social est une valeur partagée qui contribue et qui doit être partagée et qui contribue à la croissance et au développement. L'initiative du Global Deal a déjà retenu l'attention des partenaires sociaux en France. De même, déjà, des groupes français ont adhéré à cette initiative et nous continuons, sous l'égide de la ministre du Travail, à vouloir fédérer et consolider cet élan. Je crois que ce qui est important pour nous, et comme l'a dit le directeur général de l'OIT, c'est le dialogue social. C'est un élément clé pour pouvoir progresser ensemble dans tous les domaines. Je vous remercie. Right. Well, my French is reasonable, but it's not that great. So <laughs> um, I understand what you were saying about France's engagement um, in the global deal and its value. Um, I missed, I think, uh, what the question was in there. Is anybody good enough at French to... Tell me. Non. No, that's that's okay. So my 
my French was better than I thought. Thank heavens for that. It's not often that happens to me, I can tell you. Um, right, um, so um, any other questions, please? Uh, yes, please. So can I come to this lady uh, first at the front? Would you uh, tell us where you're from and uh, your name, yeah. please? I'm the ambassador of Sierra Leone. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. No, I um, just wanted to react to a number of things. First of all, when we talk about technology and employment, we're talking about retraining, and I would just wanted to ask, what, are, what is the role of the educational institutions in terms of their looking at their curricula to fit them to the labor market? Ah, oh, yes, that's an interesting my, question. My yep. second question relates to, I think it was um, from the panelists on WEF, who mentioned about looking at the global trade rules in relation to policy space. And one thing which has come out in the trade policy reviews here is that many of our countries have come out with a local content policy. And we have been questioned whether this was in line with dreams. But for us, the local content policy is so important because we are looking for employment. Yes. And um, it's very important. So this is one instance where I believe, I don't know how that could be addressed, but I believe for us it's extremely important, the local content policy. But then we have to respond whether or not it's in line with the dreams. And the third last question, oh, quickly, okay. it's, on the S, uh, it's on the sustainable development goals. Yep. Nobody is to be left behind. There's a whole portion um, on the... Addis Ababa Action Agenda, which talks about trade as an engine for development. How do, how do the panelists see this? Because the contents of that paragraph, I mean, now we are having all sorts of problems in terms of um, f implementing what the contents of that paragraph. For us, how do you see this in terms of us not being left behind, which is the theme of the Sustainable Development Goals, if what is prescribed under trade is not happening? Thank you. Okay, let's. Um, I, I'm assuming, certainly in the UK, uh, universities are greedy enough to want to um, adapt their curriculum to uh, make uh, to draw students in. So let's let's assume for a moment there's enough commercial interest there. Um, local policy space and um, and the issue of the sustainable development goal. Nobody left behind. Anybody want to uh, talk about either of those two things? And then we have to finish, otherwise I will be in trouble. Yes, please. Joachim. Right. Are educational, uh, the educational system keeping track with the digital transformation? The answer is no. Uh, and that's why, for example, we have developed uh, e-learning platforms to try to uh, develop coding skills, uh, not least in Africa. We are working with the Ministry of Education in every market that we operate. We do it together with Google and a number of other actors, bringing different actors together, Columbia University, to have the best education. But we have to link it to the local curriculum, because otherwise, what's the point, to be honest? So we are working very hard in every local market with the local Ministry of Education to make sure that they also upgrade the curriculum. I think there's a real problem here because uh, uh, government and uh, government, both on the political side and the administrative side, are having huge problems trying to anticipate what is something that is moving super fast. Yeah. And so just to be very clear, could I just say on local content policies? If you're talking about local content that will empower people to actually be better participants in the local economy and therefore drive better benefits out of global trade or globalization at large. This is absolutely fine. I mean, in the end, if you, for example, talk about the app industry, e-commerce platforms, if it's not locally attuned, and we saw that, for example, in Turkey, where women could not access the local, the more advanced e-commerce platforms, we developed an SMS service so they could upload. So you need to always localize the content in the sense of empowering people. There's a different question going around in WTO as well as facing companies, which is where uh, governments try to say, well, I don't have this manufacturing today, could I have it tomorrow? So give you a concrete example. Should the servers of a cloud that you have in your country be produced in Sierra Leone? Or should the content in that cloud be uh, attuned to the local needs? These are two separate questions. The latter one is crystal clear. It's from an economic point of view as well. The former one will be very tricky, and the reality is that the cloud development and network virtualization and all the other good things that will come with digital will come much later to countries that put such technological requirements. Well, I believe, there we must leave it, it is now um, 10 to 1, and I've been told that um, we must finish this panel. It's a fascinating point at which we leave it. Um, I regret having to leave it. I'd like to thank our panellists once again and invite uh, back to the stage the Prime Minister of uh, Sweden, Roberto, um, of uh, the Director General of uh, WTA, and also Guy Ryder, who's already with me, the Director General of the ILO. Thank you so much. Just as we... Okay.
Um, just as we're waiting for uh, the panellists to take their seats, uh, there's been much mention of the Sustainable Development Goals, and um, No One Left Behind is one of them. But of course, we've got Sustainable Development Goal 8 on decent work, uh, 10 on reducing inequality, 17 on partnerships. Uh, there is a great deal of momentum behind the global deal, I'm pleased to say. So uh, please allow me to uh, welcome back uh, Stefan Löfven, the Swedish Prime Minister. Thank you so much, and, and uh, thanks. It was a pleasure listening to all these uh, contributions. Uh, just a few perspectives to, to conclude. Uh, first, I'm very pleased that WTO will, will uh, uh, look at different cases also, uh, we, which policies work best to, uh, to handle these changes. I, I look forward to that. I would like to add a perspective that we haven't brought up, uh, including myself, and the, that is the, the gender perspective. I think we need to be very uh, cautious here, to, uh, as we do with all different policies, that we bring in the gender perspective. Uh, so we're screening all our policies also from a gender perspective, because that needs to be done. So I would, just, uh, I would like to add that. Um, secondly, I, I think uh, someone mentioned the pace and the scale of the changes that we that we're looking uh, that we're having uh, already have, but also in front of us, I think that that is um, that is an even stronger motivation for a social dialogue, because I think uh, what we are facing is is the unknown. We try to predict how the society will will uh, will develop and change, and some we can predict, but not everything. And that means that we have to be even more cautious on, on having this dialogue so that we can uh, predict the best we can. But that must include all the, the stakeholders, the actors, because if not, uh, it will be uh, more difficult to, to handle. Uh, another thing is that we are dependent on one another. I think that is crucial also to see. This will not happen if we, if we cannot act together because the best uh, result would be when, when we act together. I just, I just want to mention a very concrete example from the, the company in which I used to work as a welder. Uh, some 30 years ago, we, we were asked, approached by the company, and they said, we need to increase the productivity in our company, because otherwise this manufacturing will, will take place in another company. Can you do anything about it? And we said, we'll look into it. We came out with the results. 30%, 30% increased productivity. 3-0. How was that possible? Uh, because it meant that almost a third, uh, a third of the workforce in that part of production had to leave that production and go into something else. It was possible because I knew when I negotiated with the company that, yes, some of the workers had to leave, but they will have a job in some other part of the company. If you take that perspective into a national perspective, what does it say? This kind of change need to be handled together. So if you lose your job there, you know that you will help, will get help, support for the retraining, you find a path to a new job, and while doing so, you will, you will manage also from an economic point of view. It won't be a disaster. If you don't have that in front of you, you will resist change the most you can. So, so that is, for me, a very, very clear example that we, we need to find this. And this is not, as someone said, this is not a zero-sum game. This is not about arm wrestling between employers and employees on how to divide the, uh, the, uh, um, a volume that will never change. This is about win-win-win. If we can create conditions in which we uh, cooperate, it will be uh, an increased wealth. To share, and yes, at some point there will be some arm wrestling, negotiating, uh, of course. But but uh, but it's. Uh, I think we need to to look into that. Uh, lastly, um, about the labour market. If we look at the labour market as um, there's one supply uh, side, there's a demand side, and uh, we look at the supply side. How do we train and, and equip the workforce with the best competence ever uh, that we can do? Is one side of it. Yes. But the demand side is also important. How do we develop the new products? Uh, what, what are the best innovation systems? New products, uh, be it goods or services, that we can sell is also important. Because in that way, we know, yes, there will be jobs in the future as well. But I thank WTO for, for 
of this cooperation and yeah. And thank you very much. Guy, a few comments from you, if you wouldn't mind. Yes, no, I'll be quick. Um, after listening to the Prime Minister, I think one of the very encouraging things about the conversation uh, this morning has been the very high level of consensus that I detect in the room. Mm. I think this organisation works on the basis of unanimity, Roberto, so I don't know if we had unanimity in the room, but there seems to be a very clear understanding that yes, trade is the absolutely necessary engine of growth and greater prosperity, but those benefits do not come automatically. They require policy interventions, and we need to think much more carefully, perhaps, than we have done in the past about what those interventions look like and how we make them happen. So I think there's a lot of consensus about the what we need to do. I think the question now is how are we going to go about it? Um, and here, um, just to say something um, a little bit sort of close to home for the ILO and the WTO, I think it's very important for me to underline, and we really much appreciate it, Roberta, that we have been working together much more closely uh, in recent years. You've mentioned the uh, joint work we do on skills uh, uh, in, in relation to inclusive trade. We're not in the place we were 20 years ago when you did have the impression there was a sort of a, a separation wall down the avenue, the Rue de Lausanne, which kept the ILO away from the WTO, and <laughs> Directors General met clandestinely, which, it was, uh, which is actually the, the pure truth of the matter. Um, we're a long way away from that, and yet could I suggest from, and, and we're meeting under the sign of dialogue here, can I suggest that we need to do a little bit better, not just the ILO and the WTO, but the international system uh, in general, coming together, working out all of these highly interrelated issues, because some of you have talked about tax, some of you have talked about skills, some have talked about global supply chains. You know, nobody's got the whole part of the answer there, but they're all pieces of the answer, mm. and we need to put the pieces together. And that passes uh, through processes of dialogue. Uh, and I do hope, and it's a sort of a second dimension, Prime Minister, to, to, to the global deal, that at the same time, as countries are signing up, France has just done so, and it's great news. I wonder if international institutions can come together in the same spirit of dialogue and make the best use of the space that you're making available to us. Here, here. Guy, thank you very much. Uh, and over to you. That's good. Well, thank you. Um, I, I'm very happy with what we had this morning, uh, that we had this conversation. Uh, the WTO uh, decides uh, things by consensus but we prize diversity. So the diversity of views is very much welcome. Um, and I, and I, I think that one important message that I got out of this is that we need to have an honest conversation uh, on all this. Um, and honest on all sides. And to be frank with you, it's very easy to know who is not being honest in a conversation. It's the other guy. <laughs> uh, very easy. Always. Always the other guy. So I think we all agree that having this dialogue is important. Um, some symptoms of the problems we have are quite clear. Inequality is rising. That's a clear symptom. Uh, jobs are being lost. Uh, that's also quite clear. Uh, these disruptions in the labor market are very evident. Now, while the symptoms are clear, it's important that we get the right causes. Because if we get the wrong cause, we're going for the wrong solution. That, that I think, is the problem. And I don't think we're quite there yet in identifying the problems. Now, I heard today that you know, trade and, and, and technology, all those things are there together. That's quite true. But how, how do you... Uh, identify the real cause, if, if it's those two together, how much each one, do we need to quantify that or not? And what are the solutions that will address those problems? I think while even the problem may be easier to identify, finding the solutions is going to be very, very hard. Because I, I, I said before, and I repeat, there is not one size fits all. And not because it is technically impossible. It is because it is politically impossible. Politically impossible. Each country will have their own political reality, their own political circumstances. And the debate will come out differently in the different countries. So we have to recognize that. Now, having said that, we need to understand the little things a little bit more. Uh, we talked about global value chains. Uh, we talked about uh, 
uh, harmonization of uh, of labor standards. That's very very tricky. Let's 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 be honest with each other. If we're talking about honesty, let's be honest with each other. Um, and I have seen this conversation uh, for a long time uh, in the WTO. When I entered my career, this conversation was already there. And it's very tricky because oftentimes, I'm not saying all the time, but oftentimes, those who wanted the harmonization, they were not looking at harmonization of the standards. They were looking at harmonization of the costs. Now, that's a different proposition. And often, people were looking at this as a zero-sum game. So an employment that is created in a developing country is an employment that was not created in my country. Now, under that perspective, this is a very, very tricky conversation. Now, if you want to have it, fine, but let's go beyond the boxes. Just staying inside the boxes is not going to do it. You have to have a real deep, honest conversation about this. Now, I'm not sure that we're ready for that. Uh, members and the international community will have to tell us whether we're ready for that. What is true is that we need to do more research. We need to have an informed conversation about all this. Uh, and I think some notions are already out there. We talked about, um, and I think Sabina mentioned that uh, just skill is not enough. I think it's much broader than that. It's about education. Uh, what kind of education? It's an even tougher question. When you have a, a study recently by the World Bank that shows that two-thirds of the kids who enter fundamental school will end up working in jobs that don't exist yet. How do you prepare for that situation? Uh, my, 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 my granddaughter, she's one and a half years old. Her father was traveling and before coming back he called home and he said, what, you know, what do you want as a gift? And she barely speaks. And she said, Paped. Paped is an iPad. <laughs> All right? She's one and a half years old. Now, what do you do? Do you take away the iPad? No, that's too early for you. Or do you prepare that kid for the world of today? I think that's a challenge we all face. That's a challenge we all face. I don't think rejecting technology, rejecting innovation, or rejecting labor is the answer. It's about how do you adapt to those very fundamental, very critical changes, which are inevitable. It's going to be there. Now, I don't have the answers. Uh, I don't think anybody in this room has the answers. But collectively, we may have the answer. And I think that's what we need to do. That's what the global deal is all about. That's what the WTO is willing to do. Uh, with an honest conversation, researching and being open for uh, diversity, different views, and trying to get some kind of light uh, in this uh, situation. So thank you all very much. Once again, it was an honor to have you all here, and let's continue this conversation. This is just uh, the beginning. Yeah. Prime you. Minister, once again, thank you so much for your initiative on this subject. Let's put the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. Let's start now, and let's start here. Thank you so much for your participation and also to both direct generals. If you have difficulty communicating, there's a man from Vodafone who can help you out, I'm sure. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, it was a very, very good job.